Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Public Programs at the Massachusetts Historical Society. I'm Catherine Olgor. Um, I'm the president here at the Society, and I'm just popping in briefly to say we are thrilled at the MHS to be working with Historic New England and the History Project and kicking off the first week of Pride Month with such a distinguished panel of experts. So let's get things going. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Gavin Kleespies. Gavin. Thank you, Catherine, uh, for such a warm welcome. Uh, I'm Gavin Cleespies, the Director of Programs, Exhibitions, and Community Partnerships for the Massachusetts Historical Society, and I'm very happy to welcome a large group for our event this evening. Uh, the program tonight has been the work of a great team of people who started a dialogue a number of months ago. Uh, the discussion began with the idea that MHS wanted to make it a priority that we hosted events exploring the history of the LGBTQ community in Massachusetts. There were a few ideas that became clear early in our discussion. First, well, we did not want this to be uh, one event that was going to claim to explore the entire history in one fell swoop. We wanted this program to be the beginning of an ongoing conversation uh, and one that looked beyond the most obvious points. It was also clear that we wanted to partner with the organizations that were already doing this work. And we're very pleased that both the History Project and Historic New England are co-sponsoring this evening's programs. Uh, we could not have planned this event without our advisory committee or our co-sponsors. I realized that with a large crowd joining us, uh, there may be some people attending an MHS event for the first time. So for a very brief introduction, we are an independent nonprofit organization that maintains a research library and hosts a wide variety of programs on topics related to Massachusetts and American history. We hope that it, you'll return for future events and we hope that you will support our work by becoming a member or making a donation. Uh, this evening's program will be a panel discussion of the grassroots LGBT periodicals that originated in Boston during the uh, modern gay liberation era and evolved to become critical resources for LGBT communities all over the country. We have a great set of panels that will be moderated by Professor Russ Lopez. I will allow Professor Lopez, Lopez to introduce our panelists and I'll just give you a very brief introduction for him. Professor Lopez received his Bachelor of Science from Stanford University and his Master of City and Regional Planning from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. His doctorate is from the Department of Environmental Health at the Boston University School of Public Health. His research interests include urban environmental health and the role of cities, neighborhoods, and the structure of built environment and public health outcome. Public, uh, Professor Lopez has published articles on health uh, effects of racial segregation, income inequality, and urban sprawl. He is currently an adjunct assistant professor in environmental health at Boston University School of Public Health. So without further ado, uh, Russ, I'll hand it over to you to take over. Thank you so much for uh, letting me moderate this panel. I've been at uh, a bunch of uh, Mass Historical Society uh, events and readings and talks and to actually be participate in one is quite the honor. So thank you very much. One of the things, if you look at uh, LGBTQ history, queer history in the United States is that Boston quickly emerges as an intellectual center of what was then called the gay liberation movement. So many things happened in our city, Dickie Lards, Boston, Cambridge, um, out to Northampton, Massachusetts. Um, we really were sort of the intellectual center of gay life in this country for several decades. Um, and not only that, we produced a lot of leaders. So many organizations across the country had people who first got their start in either a queer organization or advocacy or something here in the Boston region. We also were the beginnings of theory where so much of intersec it, um, um, intersectionalism and other kinds of things that sort of propelled uh, the queer liberation movement, the queer movement from both the beginnings till today all got to start here. And also, Part of that, which I think is very important and what we're going to cover today, is that Boston was the center of so many important publications. Before the internet, if you wanted to know what other people were thinking, you had to subscribe or somehow get a hold of a newspaper, a magazine, a journal. And so many of these publications became uh, 
started here in Boston and were spread out to the country that to tell our story, to tell what we've learned to other people around. So we were so influential. And that is why we have uh, today's panel. I'd like to begin um, with uh, Harvard professor Michael Bronski, who has been involved with gay liberation since 1969 and has contributed to a variety of publications, including Bag Rag, Gay Community News, In News Weekly, The Guide, and many others. He is the author of eight books, including the recent and very, very important, A Queer History of the United States for Young People, published in 2019. Um, Michael? Thank you, Russ, um, and thank you everybody for being here. Um, Russ gave a rundown of my history. I actually lived in New Jersey in 1969, was involved with the New York uh, Gay Gay Liberation Front, right, which was the first gay, gay liberation front, and moved up here in 71 so I, to work and work with Fag Reg. So I've actually been involved with doing this along with Fag Reg, along with uh, working with Good Gay Poets and Fag Reg books and some other things. Um, I just want to do a, I want to do two two things, right? A little bit of background and sort of touching on what Russ has talked about already. Um, a, a bit of the history about publishing and activism, right? I think if we look at it in the uh, in the 1970s, there were really three centers of queer politics around the country. One was Boston, New York, and San Francisco. And New York was really sort of an organizing and professional center uh, for 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 politics. I mean, many people actually went on to become professional politicians later on. You know, San Francisco was sort of hippie and druggy and sort of the fairies. Um, but Boston was, as Russ has said, was where the theory happened, right? I'm sure Shane can talk about this as well, too. Um, it was a place that actually generated theory, right? Most often it was theory that was put into political action. And this has always been true of Boston, right? From, from the abolition movement uh, to transcendentalist Emerson and Thoreau, um, the the universal the the Unitarians, um, even F. O. Matheson and literary theory came out here in the in, within the forties, right? Um, and this was exactly what happened with, with in 1969, 1970, right? So the first magazine, I believe, one of the first in the country that went national was Lavender Vision, which we deserve a picture of. Remarkable, for, it was lesbians and gay men working together. And two of the main members were Sue Katz, who goes by the name of Katz, and Charlie Shively. Um, and Katz, both are famous for their theoretical pieces. Katz wrote uh, Smash Phallic Imperialism in 1970, and Charlie Shively wrote a long series for Bagrad called Cop Sucking as an Act of Revolution. These have remained foundational texts for 50 years. Um, Lavender Vision broke up after two issues. Fag Reg grew out of it as well as, as a women's magazine. Fag Reg lasted for, and I was involved with most of it for 20 years and over 47 issues, right? Um, and Gay Community News started in 1973, and it was, and Amy will talk about this, the first national newspaper that was published and read by lesbians and gay men together. So Boston was the first for these, right? And GCN was forthright, forthrightly progressive in its politics and covered news and culture that really set a standard for all the other national papers. And I really think that the two main outcomes of gay community news, right, was that uh, for over two decades, it was relentless in critiquing both mainstream and gay culture. And this was particularly important, right, as gay culture became more and more mainstream. Um, there was plenty to criticize in it, as, particularly as, as what we might call assimilation happened um, and then, as Russ also said, right, over the years, it produced a re remarkable number of people who became national political leaders who, within the academy um, and public intellectuals. Um, so this is really, this really fits into the history of Boston, right, not unlike Thoreau and Emerson and people coming out of the transcendentalists and really becoming national figures. Um, so I do think that when we're looking at all this, and we really have to think about, right, the the impact around the rest of the country um and but i'm thinking particularly of fag reg which i was completely involved with right fag reg was really looked at throughout oh, the first 10 years up until the no up until the mid 80s as as the paper that people went to to really think through the larger issues of of, of class of race of sexism um of 
of, of gender. We're probably the first pub, one of the first publications to have a picture of a man in uh, of a man who lived in drag on the cover in the early 70s. It was Larry Anderson. Um, so I'm good. I want to make one other point and we move on to Shane. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about because I think this is easy to I know my students know nothing about this because they're 18 to 21. But the enormous effect that HIV AIDS had on these communities, right? The first cases are reported in 1981. And obviously we all know, right, that AIDS had an enormous effect on the queer communities, on, on men, on, on, on women, on um, people, on their families, people who were adjacent to them, right? And this was completely reflected in, in all publications, right? But particularly, I think in Boston is where I root myself, right? And at first, right, AIDS was was unimaginable, and then it was all too real. So I just want to look briefly in the what I think is the three aspects that AIDS had on these publications, right? It it affected the staff, right? It affected the people doing layout, the writers, the editors, uh, the publishers. Uh, people became ill. People had to become caretakers. People had to be excused from all parts of their from parts of their job when they were too sick to actually come in. Um, it, it was simply ubiquitous, right, in, in the everyday life of a publication, right? But it also affected content, right? We, we had to begin covering demonstrations in new ways. We had to think about uh, covering medical news and writing obituaries, right? Um, the Bay Area Reporter in San Francisco literally had three, by the end of the 80s, literally had three pages of obits every week, right? But it also had a learning curve for the writers, right? Reporters had to actually learn a entirely new realm of medical knowledge and report on it. Um, and they had to translate it for the non-medical reader who was desperate for it. And I think most of all, right, that the largest change, and, and this is something that Fran Lebowitz says about the arts down in New York, it wasn't just the magazines that were affected, it was the readerships, right? Any, any publication that exists because of its readership. I mean, sure, there are people who write and publish and produce the publication, but, but it lives because of its readership. And the effect of AIDS on their readership is impossible to gauge, right? It depends on feedback, on guessing, on translating one's own personal experience. Um, so I just wanna say that, that as, we, as we go on, we're talking about this and for all the publications, feminist publications or queer publications, um, that in fact, the, the, the effect of AIDS is, is just so intrinsic to how we should think about this uh, that uh, it just cannot ever be, be forgotten. So that's all I wanted to say and I'll have more when people have questions later. So much for that. Okay, sure. Um, our next speaker is uh, Shade Snowden. Uh, she was the editor of Sojourner, great uh, uh, journal magazine from 1983 to 1987. She went on to be a university-based advocate around LGBTQ plus and women's issues and a serial nonprofit executive director at a domestic violence agency, two women's health organizations, an environmental center, and an initiative to support men formerly imprisoned. Shane? Well, uh, thank you, Russ. I I'm just so grateful that this is happening, that we are all here tonight. And, and you know, as uh, Gavin suggested, I hope this is not our, our last date uh, because I literally worry every day about what I call the vanished world of the feminist and the queer publications of the late 60s, the 70s, and the early 80s. Ask myself and anyone who will listen, will it actually be forgotten that before for the internet, before the internet, those publications, they, we, were absolutely crucial to the social, social transformation, really the revolution brought about by feminism and by what we then called gay and lesbian liberation. Yeah, it was not the revolution we envisioned, but it was a revolution that profoundly changed our society for the better in ways that everyone amazingly takes for granted now, including us. And as, as we're all gonna be saying, a lot of the transformative theory building and movement building and life-saving, world-changing, life-altering work at that time happened right in Boston, as, as Russ and Michael said. So 
what I want to do because I believe in naming names is and also because the publications were so intertwined with everything else feminist and queer in Boston. I wanted to run down some of the groundbreaking feminist initiatives of that time in Boston. They weren't explicitly lesbian or bi, as many of you may remember, but like Sojourner, they were way disproportionately lesbian and bi in terms of who created them, who staffed them, and who supported them. So what I, I'm going to name these names. You will notice that uh, these organizations, these feminist initiatives were formed in a very short period of time. And although other cities had some of them or most of them, I think Boston is unique in the lineup I'm about to run down. First of all, the Women's Center in Cambridge, the oldest women's center in the country, still going strong, created in 71. The Boston Area Rape Crisis Center, created in 73, still going strong, first in New England, second oldest in the country. The Combahee River Collective, Barbara Smith et al. And what an et al. Finally, now getting the attention it deserves, created in 1974 for writing and theory building, morphed into Kitchen Table Women of Color Press in 1980. Elizabeth Stonehouse, born in 74, still going strong, alternative, groundbreaking uh, support for women with mental illness. New Words, created in 1975, same year as Sojourner, one of the longest lived women's bookstores in the country. It morphed into the Center for New Words, um, beyond a bookstore in its later years. Transition House, first domestic violence shelter in New England and second in the country created in 76. What an explosion of activity. And as I say, very intertwined with those initiatives were the feminist publications of the time in Boston. And again, these are way disproportionately lesbian and bi, although they weren't explicitly so in most cases. Um, very disproportionately so in terms of the writing and the staffing and the support. First, No More Fun and Games, a Journal of Female Liberation. And it's finally getting some of the attention that it deserves, including in this, I have to chill for, although I'm, uh, I, I receive no kickback, women's liberation, feminist writings that inspired a revolution and still can, a brand new book. Uh, no More Fun and Games, uh, one of the great early theory building books of the second wave, socialist feminist, radical feminist, lesbian feminist, created in 1968 in Somerville. Uh, Our Bodies Ourselves, begun in 1970 as mimeographed sum as dot. Read about down there. Dare to read about down there. Second Wave, a monthly journal created in Cambridge in 71. Sister Courage, uh, a monthly newspaper that I think Amy's going to say a little bit about, created in 74. Persephone Press, incredibly groundbreaking lesbian feminist book publisher, created in 76 out in Watertown. Equal Times, also created in 76, the Boston weekly feminist paper till 84. So what about Sojourner? It was created as the uh, MIT women's newspaper in 1975, very soon moved off campus. I think everyone was happy about that. It, <coughs> excuse me, fairly shortly became a national monthly. And it, founded in 75, did not close until 2002. It lasted 27 years, and that is the longest lasting publication, well, except for Ms. Magazine, uh, and except for Off Our Backs down in DC, which closed in 2008. Blessed be Off Our Backs. I was there, uh, as mentioned, from 83 to 87. I was the editor. Sojourner was not a pure collective. Uh, interestingly, it was unlike many of the groups that I've mentioned, the pubs I've mentioned, it was not a pure collective. It did have something of a hierarchy. Also, Sojourner, not explicitly lesbian, but also not explicitly feminist, interestingly. Our subtitle was Sojourner, the Women's Forum. That was very, very deliberate, the Women's Forum. We wanted any woman, any woman at all, to feel comfortable picking us up and reading us. Any woman who might not identify with the word lesbian, might not identify with the word feminist, any woman. We were about recruitment to feminism <laughs> as a start. How did we go about that? What was in Sojourner? What did we care about, even if we couldn't achieve it every, every second? We were more about community building and movement building than theory building. So we did have essays by the big thinkers, some of them famous, Audre Lorde, Jim Jordan, Pat Parker, Adrian, uh, 
Adrian Rich, Grace Paley, Sheree Moraga, Gloria Asaldua, but a lot of our content was writing grounded in women's personal experiences. We took the personal as political very seriously. A lot of these women, not only, you know, I'd never um, been, you know, heard of before, but they had never written before. And they just wrote about bisexuality, cancer, immigration, internment during World War II, sexual abuse, mental illness, class oppression, life in poverty, imprisonment, choosing singlehood, being in a Palestinian refugee camp, being at the Seneca Peace Encampment, being at the first UN Women's Conference in Kenya. That meant that we supported a lot of women in learning how to write. And if that wasn't possible, they didn't feel it was possible, we interviewed them. Beyond all of this, we tried to do it all in our sections. We highlighted feminist books, women's music, other women's art. Although it was really labor intensive, we ran fiction and poetry. We got hundreds of submissions every month and we published them very labor intensive. We ran incredibly high quality photography. We, uh, that meant so much to us. And we also critiqued popular culture, film and books and music. We also, and this was um, different from a lot of the publications, we tried to support connection in a whole variety of ways. So in our pages, I would say nothing was more read than our calendar, our news briefs, which were both local and national like our calendar, the letters to the editor, that's where a lot of the dialogue happened, and our advertising, which wasn't advertising, it was saying to women, offering businesses and services, come on out, connect. In real life, we held big public events. We were a, a place where you could physically meet other women by volunteering for the paper. And we distributed Soj free um, around the country and in Boston. And I'll stop there. You can tell I could go right on, but it's time for me to wrap up. So look forward to the questions. I think one of the things that came out of both you and um, Michael is just the excitement of that time um, that continues, right? When you look back upon the, the 70s and 80s, um, this, there was just this energy that um, sort of propelled these, um, the people working in these um, publications um, that helped make them so vital. Um, so our next um, panelist, is uh, Amy Hoffman, who first gained uh, her national reputation through her work at uh, GCN, Gay Community News. She is a writer, teacher, editor, and social justice ad activist. Her books have won important awards, and we are all excitedly waiting for the arrival of her latest novel, Doc and Ralphie, next year. Amy? Thank you so much, Russ, and um, thank you, everyone on this panel. It's wonderful to hear Michael's and Shane's um, descriptions of GCN and Sojourner, and I have so much to say about it. But what I decided to do um, for my talk is read a section from my memoir about gay community news, which is called, the memoir is called An Army of Ex-Lovers, which is a joke. Um, there, there's a gay liberation slogan that said an army of lovers cannot fail. And so the question was, what about an army of ex-lovers? Um, I want to, the, the passage kind of shows you what it was, what it felt like, some of that excitement that Russ was just talking about. So I'm going to talk about how I first um, got involved with gay community news. Richard and I used to say we'd have to write the book about gay community news before any of the others got to it and did it all wrong. Actually, it's hard to imagine how Richard and I thought we could write a book together when we disagreed so much. We debated for years, literally from dawn to dusk, as we worked together at the GCN office, went out afterwards for dinner to the whole wheat pizza place on Charles Street where you could bring your own jug of wine and where I more than once saw a little gray mouse leap across the floor and disappear under the baseboard. And we called each other up on the phone as soon as we got home. I first met Richard Burns in the fall of 1978 when I called the Gay Community News office to inquire about the features editor job opening that I'd read about on a poster at my feminist therapist's bulletin board. He picked up the phone and we immediately got into a debate. 
explaining the $60 per week salary, Richard said, it's hard to get used to being poor. No one gets used to being poor, I corrected him. He laughed. I guess not, doll. He signed me up for an interview. He loved calling everyone doll, which he'd picked up from Greg Howell and Harry Sang, the ad manager and managing editor respectively, when Richard had first started working at the paper. Greg and Harry were Fort Hill faggots for freedom, living with about 20 other gay men in several frighteningly dilapidated houses in Roxbury, where their African-American neighbors who were unhappy enough about the white Rasta commune down the street did not appreciate them at all. Richard had moved to Boston right after graduating from a snooty men's college where he had been famous as the only gay man for miles and miles. He'd gone straight to GCN where the men said doll and my dear and shamelessly waved, the, waved their arms around and had wild sex with each other without a thought of pretending they were too drunk to know what they were doing. I picked it all up from Richard, the mannerisms, not so much the wild sex, once I started working at the paper and he and I became friends. First though, I had to be interviewed. By the time I came around, the GCN interview process had changed. No longer did the entire collective of staff, volunteers, board members, and hangers-on gather to interrogate potential editors about their views on drag, feminism, semicolons, the intersection of race, gender, and the American system of social and economic class, the nuclear family, whether they'd come out yet to their mom, intergenerational sex, and the GCN advertising policy, which strictly forbade publishing ads that exploited the human body to sell things. Although what constituted exploitation was a matter of perpetual debate. Why couldn't a gay bar depict a humpy gay sailor, for example, when the customer's hope of meeting such a person there was exactly the point? On the other hand, the odds of their actually count encountering a sailor were not good. I was interviewed instead by a hiring committee, an innovation that some condemned as elitist, but that was less likely to scare away the few applicants willing to attempt subsistence on a GCN salary. As it turned out, the GCN hiring committee was not simply interviewing me for a job. It was nothing less than the mystical hiring committee for the rest of my life. Richard was on it. My beloved Roberta, although she and I wouldn't get together for another 10 years. To be honest, I don't exactly remember Roberta on the hiring committee, but she insisted again this morning over breakfast that she absolutely was, so I'm putting her in. Sometimes in the middle of the night, I still wonder, what if they'd rejected me at that crucial moment? Would I have any friends now? It's not a complete exaggeration to claim that I was awestruck by my first experience of the GCN office. It was like any other newspaper office in a way, and this description is obviously outdated. Toppling piles of back issues everywhere, magazines, papers, notepads, and strange hardcover books that no one would ever review, much less read. Banks of banged up file cabinets, telephones ringing, typewriters. We had typewriters chattering and dinging, people muttering and grumbling, a refrigerator full of half-eaten sandwiches and cans of Coke. The thing that got to me was the newspapers on the walls. Every issue of GCN, GCN had ever published was displayed in rows, starting at the ceiling and extending around the entire perimeter of the room. Who knows whose idea it has, had originally been? Probably it just happened. The sudden inspiration of a volunteer with a staple gun in one hand and a newspaper in the other. The cumulative effect was impressive. Once I started working there, I would feel newly inspired each morning when I glanced around the office and saw all that we had accomplished over the years. That is, when I didn't feel completely disheartened. Photos and drawings were expensive, and budget aside, it was just hard to come up with something striking and relevant week after week, and covers were so the sites of some of our worst mistakes, ugly, trivial, obnoxious. 
I doubt we ever published one that anyone was completely satisfied with. Maybe it was the cover display that had given rise to a culture of sticking all kinds of things on the walls. Every person who entered the office eventually participated in the unintentional, unintentional collective creation of a collage of clippings, doodles, quotes, snapshots, to-do lists, postcards, cartoons, typeset articles for the next issue, hate mail, love letters, long lost telephone numbers, political leaflets, placards from demonstrations, photos from magazines, gay and straight, of buff guys in various postures, all without shirts, and an Elaine Noble for state rep styrofoam boater hat with red, white, and blue band. Things were constantly being added, and no one ever bothered to take anything down, so that below the orderly rows of covers was a chaos of layers upon layers of an ever-evolving artwork of the people. To enter the office, you came up a steep flight of stairs from the street and through the open door on your left, and there you were, right in the middle of it, with bullet holes in the windows in front of you and the long light tables of the art department in back. Behind the art department, separate from the GCN office by a partition, was the office of Fagrag, an anarchist collective vaguely contiguous with the Fort Hill Faggots of Freedom. At unpredictable intervals, they would publish a journal that had somehow come to the attention of William Loeb, the infamously conservative publisher of the Manchester, New Hampshire Union leader, who had termed it the most loathsome publication in the English language, a motto that the fagraggers gleefully pasted all over their masthead. The trick question at my interview was about the art on the latest fag rag cover. Just, you know, did I like it? The fag raggers had submitted it to, as the illustration for an ad they were placing in GCN and were at that very moment reveling in the predictable uproar among their landlords about whether the image was beautiful, vulgar, exploitative, oppressive to women, or a proud expression of gay male sexuality. Well, it wouldn't sell me a magazine, I offered brightly. This response was apparently equivocal enough to appease most of the committee. And by the time I left, we were all feeling so pleased with each other that when I got you back to my apartment, my phone was already ringing. It was Richard offering me the job. And that's enough of that for now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, the only thing I would say is that um, for my first visit to the GCN offices, you actually kind of downplayed how busyness. Of oh, the yeah. <laughs> well, also, I should say one more thing. I don't want to take up too much time, but I've never given a talk about GCN without someone coming up to me and telling me that picking up a copy of gay community news was one of their first acts of coming out. It was just incredibly personally and politically important. I think that's something that really binds together all these publications. Uh, picking up these journals, these magazines, was an act of self um, propelling into uh, a new world, right? You. It was often where people first came out or first acknowledged themselves to be who they truly were. Our final speaker is uh, Dallas Denning. Uh, Dallas is renowned for her work on advocacy, policy issues, and health practices involving transsexual and transgender people. A prolific author and a dedicated editor, she was one of many founders of the, of the Southern Comfort and Peachtree Transgender Conferences, and since 1991 has been a principal of the long-running Fantasia Fair Transgender Week Conference in Provincetown. Dallas? Hi, yes. Um, thank you very much, um, Historical Society, for inviting me to this panel. I'm really pleased to be here. Um, I was raised in the South, and support was pretty much non-existent down there. There were pockets of 
there were places where people could go, but you couldn't find out where they were. The only, as I was growing up, as I was in my early teens, the only identifiable source of support was an organization for heterosexual cross-dressers. And its founder, Virginia Prince, was very adamant that there were no gays and no transsexuals, meaning people who were interested in changing their sex in the group. So I was ineligible for, for membership and I could find no information. In the late seventies, I took myself, when I learned about it, to the gender identity program at Vanderbilt University in Nashville where I was living and applied for, for help with, with having a, a sex reassignment and was told I was not dysfunctional enough to qualify as transsexual, which was, which was a shock, but that was the medical definition at the time. Um, being transgender was highly medicalized and their picture of people like me were that we were dysfunctional in almost every conceivable way. So I was looking for information, I was looking for support and I wish to God I had been in Boston because things were happening in Boston that, that just weren't happening in the South. Now my Boston connection began when I came across an issue of Transgender Tapestry Journal, which was then called TVTS Tapestry Journal. And they had a list in the back of people providing services. I was living in East Tennessee and there was a listing for a support group for trans people in Atlanta. And I took myself down there and suddenly got all the information I had been looking for for my entire teen and adult life. And that facilitated my, my transition. And the, the group I went to drafted me to be their director and that's how I got involved in leadership. So had it not been for that copy of that Boston-based magazine, I don't know if I wouldn't still, still be like, of course things have changed, but then finding anything was just almost a miracle. Um, my other connection with Boston is the Fantasia Fair event. That is a week-long event, originally considered to be for transsexuals, but for all transgender people. It has been running in Provincetown since 1975. It came about because of existing conditions in, in, in uh, existing support groups in Boston and they wanted a place to come together and, and three people, two people financed it and one ran it and the first Fantasia Fair was held in 1975 and the attendees couldn't believe they were walking around with, without getting arrested. Um, Fantasia Fair has continued and I have been a principal in it since 1991. And, and, and so that's one of my Boston connections. The other one was in Atlanta, I founded a, a, a nonprofit 501c3 organization called American Gender Education Service that ran through 1998. And shortly after that, I was um, contacted by a board member of IFG ENS to edit um, the International Foundation for Gender Education's uh, magazine Tapestry, the very one that I had chanced across that changed my life. And I said yes, and I edited Tapestry um, for a period of almost 10 years. Um, that's my final uh, Boston connection, but just the energy that was going on in Boston, and I started going up to Boston in 1992, and I've been up every year since for at least a week, um, really was affecting people outside of the immediate area and not just trans people, but, you know, lesbian and gay people and bisexual people as well. So um, I wish I could have been a part earlier. I was ready. I just, I just could not find a community for that many years. Um, all of our panelists, um, really a wonderful, wonderful uh, presentations that I hope uh, for those of you who are too young or didn't live there or who lived through all this, um, can use to sort of remember the excitement and the intellectual ferment and just the way that we used to 
communicate with each other and how we came about to how we are today. So we're gonna open up to questions. Um, please use the, uh, the function there to uh, feed your things to the moderators. I was gonna um, start with one, if you don't mind. Um, I guess it's for any of the, any of, uh, the panelists. Um, what would you tell your former selves from those days, knowing what you know today? I mean, the benefit of, um, not, to, not to be ages, but the benefit of several decades of experience and experiences that we've had since those uh, heady times. I don't know, who, which one of you like to go first? I will. This is Dallas. Um, had I had any idea what was going on in San Francisco or New York or Boston, other than a vague notion that those were places where trans people sometimes gathered, I would have made a, made a visit to Boston and I would have found the centering probably when I was 15 or 16 years old that it took me until I was 39 years old to find. And I would have found community and that would have changed my life. 20 years earlier than it actually did. Uh, like a typical feminist, a lesbian feminist of the day, I, there are several things that I would tell my, my younger self. Um, as in the context of Sojourner, we occasionally made compromises that I regret. We did try to be all things to all women. So for example, we were late to pick up dykes to watch out for. That's something that I've always remembered and regretted. GCN picked it up. I would say first and foremost, <sighs> I so wish, I so wish we had been more diverse. In some ways we were, class and age. The women's movement of that time attended to class much more than it's given credit for, but in terms of race and ethnicity, I, oh, I so wish we had been more diverse. And somehow, although I would ask much more of myself uh, at Sojourn and in general of that time, I know that I would say to myself, please take care of yourself please get sleep, don't burn out. But at the time I, I wanted to and, and did give it all to this movement that had I felt had saved my life as a, as a lesbian and a woman in general. I actually have a different question for um, Michael and Amy. And that is why Boston? Why here? Why did Boston become the sort of the intellectual center of um, the LGBTQ uh, movement, if not nationally, almost even internationally. Sure, I can, I can, I'm sure Amy has a lot to say about this because we've actually spoken about it for the last four decades. Um, but the, I mean, I think part of it is structural, right? I think that in fact, there's lots of rent control apartments here. People could live, I mean, my, my, my first Cambridge apartment was $145 for the three of us. <laughs> and it was 10 minutes from Harvard Square, <laughs> right? Uh, you could live cheaply. Um, you could actually apply for welfare, get welfare cheaply um, and pretty easily, right? I think that the living conditions were in place for people to have, uh, you know, part time. I mean, I worked as a, as a cook. I worked in the baths for two years. I worked... As a as a part time chef in a restaurant, you know you could work part time and do this uh, do all of this other work, and and also the the sort of emotional structures are here. I mean, you know, you also had rent control in New York and San Francisco, right? But but in New York, it it's just a, it's a different city. It's structurally it's a very different city, right? Um, it it doesn't lend itself to sort of community building, and 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 the New York vibe was actually to become professional. And every gay writer I know in New York wanted to have a book out within two months. And every Boston writer, you know, um, didn't have, or if they had that dream, they actually didn't say it. But also there was there was a community here that 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 you didn't find in other in like other places, right? San Francisco, even though there are many people living there who were stable there, they were all over the place, right? And Boston really had a community that that was literally stable. I mean, I I still have friends that I made in 1971. <laughs> I mean. And that many, many have died, but I still the ones that are living, we're still friends. Amy, you want to follow up on that? Um, yeah, I think you're absolutely right about a lot of that. And I noticed in the Q and A um, chat that someone said, "Why don't we have these publications now?" 
And I think that you're pointing to some of the economics of the early 70s has a lot to do with that. Not to mention, you know, that we have lots of different ways of communicating now. I mean, I've seen articles in the New York Times and the Boston Globe about um, gay life and gay culture and queer life and queer culture that would have appeared in GCN. I mean, there was... It's hard to describe now how completely out of the mainstream we were. And to the, I mean, there was absolutely no, you weren't allowed to use, well, the people always say this, it's true that you were not allowed to use the word homosexual, to the, use the word gay in a headline in the New York Times until 1987. Um, so, you could, there were, the mainstream media didn't even have the language to talk about us. Um, and, but I think, so the, I suppose one of the things that was special about Boston was the economics, the fact that it's a relatively small city with lots of interconnections among people, um, the fact that there are a lot of colleges and universities here, so there are a lot of young people, there is a, a very active cultural life of theater and books and music. Um, I think all of that contributed to um, why Boston was so political and producing so much culture, so much stuff. So one of our qu next question comes actually from one of the people in the chat. Um, what was the relationship between the Combehi River Collective and the various publications you worked on? Or even more broadly, what were the inspirations? Who were, who were your role models when you all were doing this kind of work? Can I, can I, I talk I, to that? No. Oh. I, I just wanted to say uh, something about Combehi River and um, GCN. Mm -hmm. Because one of the initiating um, impulses for the formation of the Combahee River Collective was a series of murders in Boston of black women. And Combahee came together, organized a lot of um, demonstrations and brought this to the attention. The police in Boston would not even see this, these murders as related um, and, and at first. And there were, was barely any coverage in the Globe or the Herald at the time of, of the fact that these women were being killed. So I, and GCN covered that from the beginning, um, was at, very active in covering it. So we were really bound up, I think, in the very beginnings of the formation of Combahee River Collective. And Shane Sojourner was also part of that. Yeah, you know, I, I, I have already said, and I can't say too many times, uh, how much more diverse and representative I wish uh, we had been and all of our publications and initiatives have been. But as it happens, and I think this is partly a Boston thing, there were nine members of the Combahee River Collective and um, two of them were on the board and staff of Sojourner. Um, I just remember this, I wrote these down, Demita and Akasha, Demita Frazier and Akasha Hole, and another, Five of them regularly wrote for Sojourner Barbara and Beverly Smith, Audrey Lord, Cheryl Clark, Margot, um, Helen and Sherlane, famously now uh, first, first lady of New York City, didn't. But we had a very intertwined relationship, as with the National Black Feminist Organization, from which they arose critiquing the homophobia of that organization, and certainly with Kitchen Table Woman of Color Press. And again, there's a symbiotic relationship between Sojourner and all the other feminist initiatives in which they gave benefits, they read it new words, their writing was in Sojourner, and they personally inspired so much activism and so many activists in the Boston area. So we had a very uh, intertwined relationship, part of that made possible, as others have said, by the compactness of the Boston area. We we, did, we saw a lot of each other. I want to say one other thing, though, about Boston and racism, which you can hardly not talk about Boston and racism when you're looking at the period of time that we're looking for at in these publications. Boston was an incredibly segregated city, an incredibly violent city at that time. The schools were being um, 
you know, busing was happening, the schools were supposedly supposed to be desegregated, people in South Boston were, were literally um, rioting against black people coming into their neighborhoods. So it's not surprising that the um, queer community sort of was no, no more was as, as segregated as the rest of the community. And um, it's not surprising, Shane, that there were not, that, you know, Sojourner did not have more active participation by people of color um, because, you know, the communities were operating quite separately, um, except maybe in crisis, you know, as we were talking about Combahee River. Um, there were certainly places where we all came together, but I think it's important to see this context that we were working in as well. It's one of the really incredibly negative and insular things about Boston that I disliked when I moved here. Um, so I guess sort of looking at that broader, um, do you have any idea what were the readership numbers and to what extent your um, people who read your journals and your magazines, uh, were they local to Boston or were they really spread across the country? I can just, uh, go ahead. <laughs> oh, just to give a very quick rundown, it, I, you know, it depends on what year are we talking about, Russ? When I arrived at Sojourner in 83, it was down to 12 pages. It was printing several hundred copies. It had become a local paper. Four years later, four years later in 87, we had um, between 40 and 60,000 circulation. We're printing 10,000 copies, definitely a national publication and remained that way through 2002. The uh, GCN always had ambitions to be a national publication. We thought of ourselves that way, at least starting in the late 70s. Um, our circulation was always tiny, but we felt like our um, influence was much larger than our circulation. I don't think our, our circulation numbers were ever more than 5,000, would you say, Michael? Probably 5,000, right? But I think that what, if, if you, uh, what, what newspapers and magazines do, they write that they have a print number, then they have a readership number. Right. We always right. said that. The number is always like five times the print number, right? And I right. think that with gay publications, and I, I know this is true of Fagreg, right? When I was, uh, when Charlie Shively, who was, wrote Cox Sucking as, as an active revolution in Fagreg, and, um, you know, when when he when he became ill and I was his guardian, I we, I donated all of his papers to to Yale, and he had like 147 boxes. Of, so he'd say literally everything along with 30 cats in the house, um, which is actually pretty horrible. Um, but but I found a file in in one of his files right that literally had the index cards of all the men who had subscribed to Fagreg in the in 73 or 74. And they were literally throughout the entire country. Uh, in my uh, in Idaho, right? And they were on little those little index cards written in pen. <laughs> well, that's how we did our distribution, and I think it's yeah. worth saying that this is before computers, even photocopy machines were rare. Um, yeah. As I read, we were typing things on typewriters in order to mail out the publications. And Russ, I think you were involved in this. Mm -hmm. um, every week at GCN, people would come together to stuff envelopes. They were called the Friday folders because we used to fold them and fold the magazine and stuff it into envelopes. It had to be in an envelope because you could not mail something that said gay on the cover to people without a plain brown wrapper. <laughs> and yeah, same with my crack. Um, and also we, we at one point, yeah, we had these little cards in a machine called an addressograph that printed out the, the labels for the publication. And at one point, we used to keep that in a safe deposit box down the street because we had to, we felt very responsible to be, um, to really keep a very tight um, security on our su subscriber list because people felt like their, if their names got out that they subscribed to a queer publication, their lives would be um, ruined. Yeah. I, guess I, I wanted to ask Dallas about mm -hmm. the publication she was um, 
part of to what extent was the sort of a national responsibility even to get the word out to folks all over? Yeah, um, Tapestry towards the end of, of, of its run was printing about 10,000 copies. Um, but I would imagine in the, in the early 80s when it was just getting going, in late 70s, it was, um, it was launched as a, as a pretty much two page printed sheet in the, in the 70s, but I would imagine in the early 80s, it was probably doing more like three or four, but those copies were going all around the world and people, as had been mentioned, were passing them around. Um, Fantasia Fair actually is a small event because you can't have a big event in Provincetown because there's no place to have it, but, but it also has an international reach with people coming from all over the world since 1975. Um, so Russ, the next I add something that when I was in London two two Decembers ago or less, yeah, I guess two Decembers ago, uh, I gave a talk about Fagring Charlie Shively at Gaze the Word Bookstore, and they literally brought up the files from 1978, and there was a Fagrag address where they had where we had sent them 15 copies of every issue. Hmm. And after my talk, two men came up to me, both either my age or a little bit older. And said that they still had their fag rags that they had bought at Gaze the Word in the late 70s. So I think that the reach of these, as, as Dallas was saying, it really is, is not national, it's international. Um, what, one thing you should all know is that the uh, Shively papers have been cataloged and now have been open to the public, or they were until the whole Yale library system was shut down for the pandemic. But uh, you can now go and see all these things. So that's a, mm -hmm. a wonderful thing that we have uh, for part of our legacy. Um, another question um, comes from Timothy Patrick McCarthy. Um, given how important these print publications were personally in terms of coming out and coming into ourselves and politically in terms of becoming um, part of, a, of communities and movements, how do the panelists position and interpret the social media revolution in the, in the context of the long history of queer cultural change? In other words, what happened with the internet and our publications and our communities? I was at GCM from 75 until the bitter end, the very bitter end. <laughs> and I think the internet, we just didn't have enough money to actually become part of the internet and publish, um, yeah, publish online. So I, th I think to some degree the internet sort of sort of hurt GCN, whereas it helped many, many other magazines. So I think the answer is each each publication has its own relationship to it. Um, I mean, I, I actually think Fagrag would have thrived on the internet. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, I, it's a really no, hard, oh, I'm sorry, no, Dallas. No, go ahead, I'll, I'll go after you. No, I, I have a terrible interrupting habit. Um, I, it's really hard to generalize, as Michael was saying. I think, um, you know, we the the whole the the need for the publications changed. I mean, GCM was a newspaper, and we we covered events and we published news articles as well as cultural coverage and debates, and the need for a newspaper was not the same. You could find out that Harvey Milk was assassinated if something like that happened now. You could find out in the Times. You could not find out those things, even horrendous major things, um, when in the 70s when, when we're talking about. It's like I said before, it's hard to imagine how completely marginal we were. So I think, you know, there's a lot of different factors um, that, if, you know, the, the community is structured differently now, the needs are different, um, the finances are different, the economy is different. Um, it's really hard to make a general statement about that. Uh, In the, coming on from um, um, what you just said about marginalization, we have a, a, a fortune is going to have to be our last question. but. Um, some of our panelists were active at a time when it was sometimes dangerous to 
to be known as an out journalist, an activist, or even an out person. How, how did you guys, how did you folks um, handle that fear and the danger of the time? Uh, I just want to say GCN was, I mentioned in my piece that there were bullet holes in the front windows. Um, our office was vandalized many times over the years and it was fine and it was burned down in 1970, in 1982. Um, so yeah, we were quite clearly under attack. Um, there were also staff members, I mean, even before AIDS, wreaked all kinds of havoc and devastation and um, on us. Um, people, we had staff members who, who killed themselves, who were murdered. Um, there was a, a tremendous atmosphere of, of violence and destruction in a lot of ways against the gay community. Um, I think what helped was the solidarity that we felt with each other in the community within it. Um, that we cared about each other, that the office, even though it had been vandalized, really felt like a safe space. People would just come there to hang out. It wasn't only a news, a newspaper. Um, people, some people came every day to eat lunch there. People would just come to be there and to be around other people in the community. And when any big crisis in the community happened, that was one of the places we, we gathered as uh, uh, not explicitly lesbian or bi publication, Sojourner had fewer concerns about this, of course, than GCN at all. But I do want to say we worried a lot about our readers from this perspective because we distributed free, because we had so many copies going out to so many people and so wanted to reach women everywhere they were. Someone asked in the question box very, you know, very understandably, why didn't you run Dykes to watch out for? And you know why that was? We were scared that if a paper fell open to that, it's much easier for someone who wishes ill for the woman who's gotten that copy of Sojourner to see a cartoon with the word Dykes than to deal with, you know, an, you know, an article with a headline and small print about various, you know, lesbian feminist thoughts and feelings. It was because of our readers' safety, because we had so many different readers um, that we didn't do that. And we did worry, uh, we, we knew that even getting Sojourner was a revolutionary um, for good or for ill in terms of personal safety, a revolutionary act for women. I wanted to say that trans people are, are sort of running point on this because many are visibly distinguishable and they can't blend in. And so we continue to be murdered at, especially trans women at, at high rates. And uh, I wanted also to say a word about the last question, which was that in the mid 90s, I saw what was coming with the internet and I predicted that the what I call brick and mortar nonprofits were going to be in real trouble and it's just not economically feasible in most cases to run a print magazine these days and that's a shame because um, they were wonderful and I was proud to be a part of two of them and um, thank goodness there are places that are preserving those and so our history is mm -hmm is is secure in that regard yeah yeah i th think i mean russ can i just say something very quickly sure. that I, I think that the the um the the enormous influence of all these magazines on mainstream culture cannot be underestimated like amy pointed out that in fact you and amy said you couldn't say gay in the headline in the time you actually couldn't say it in the middle of a story either you had to say homosexual unless you're saying gay activist alliance right but the other day, I think it was last Thursday, maybe or Saturday, um, I looked at my New York Times site, which I look at a, sort of every few hours. And under the obit, there were three obits listed of openly lesbian women, which was Rusty Warren, the the the, the dirty comedian, this was a lesbian, um, Alex Dobkin, the 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 foremother of all of women's music, and Kay. I never know has Kay. Lucen, is that how you say her name, Shane? Kate, Kate Tobin, she's sometimes called. She was Barbara Greer's partner, right? 
Um, I know, so on the, right on the New York Times page, three of them, and each of them had extensive obits, right? And that would not have happened without Sojourner, without Gay Community News, without Tapestry, without Bag Rag, without any of this. I, I would just quickly point out that, interestingly, yes, this huge shift to the internet with gifts, with challenges, all the rest, the journals, some of the, the queer journals and feminist journals, they have persisted partly because it, uh, it, they publish articles too long don't read for the internet because it is somewhat easier in production terms, although not easy to publish less frequently. We have, um, I, I think joining us, the editor and publisher of Sinister Wisdom, one of the great old publications. Right, uh, right. It was in Massachusetts for a while. Adrian Rich and Michelle Cliff edited it mm -hmm. out in Western Massachusetts. Um, those do persist. And I want to make sure you know they're part of our conversation also. The journals that are quarterly or even biannual. Yeah. So I'm going to jump in because Mass Historical told us that we needed to finish by 6.30 and it's 6.34. And I hate to be the one that gets to do this after listening to this wonderful conversation for the last hour. Um, I'm Joan Alaco, for those of you who don't recognize my floating head from all of these Zooms. I'm the executive director of the History Project and it's absolutely been my pleasure to have been part of planning this panel, to have uh, met with these speakers, to have met with Mass Historical Society and the wonderful folks working there. And I just wanna say thank you all so much for tonight. Uh, we will be sending all of the questions to the panelists. So that if there are some answers that we'd like to check in on or people that we want to check on, we can do that. Um, and just based on these comments, I'm going to have to go back to the History Project Events and Outreach Committee. And we're going to have to do something like this again soon because it has just been so wonderful to hear from all of you. Uh, the archivist in me wants me to let everyone in the audience know several of these publications are available either online or in repositories around the country. Schlesinger has Sojourner. Uh, History Project has copies of Fagrag and some of Charlie Shively's papers. Uh, Northeastern University has made gay community news digitized, and it is online. Um, and the Digital Transgender Archive has many copies of Tapestry. I'm not sure if it's a full run, but they've pulled them from repositories all around the country and the world. So they still exist. <laughs> They're still out there. They're still available to you. And when the History Project can invite folks back into our archives in Boston, you can come visit us to see some of them as well. Uh, and with that, I'd just like to say happy Pride Month. Thank you all so much. And I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you.